All right, guys, so today I'm going to start walking you through a little bit of the genetics notes. We're going to go through some of the history stuff, uh, Gregor Mendel, that type of thing, which you should have learned a little bit about him yesterday when you watched a little YouTube video I gave you for the warm-up. So we're going to get up to um, where we start to talk about Punnett squares, but we're not going to get into how to do them until next week. So next week I'll make some more videos for you, kind of walking you through how to do the different variations of Punnett square, or I'll find some YouTube videos where they walk you through the different variations. Uh, I'll probably also give you guys some uh, like worksheets to do next week. Um, you'll just have to do it on paper, take a picture, and then upload your answers just to show me that you understand how to do the Punnett squares. I think you guys will like this unit. If you like puzzles and solving things, you'll like this one. All right. Um, First guy we got to talk about is Gregor Mendel. Obviously, you guys learned a little bit about him yesterday with the warm-up. Um, Austrian monk. He was born in the Czech Republic. Pretty smart guy. Um, sent him off to study uh, math and science at the University of Vienna. He eventually ended up uh, heading up the monastery, and he did have a hobby, which was studying pea plants. Um, and he had like uh, this whole little garden he would mess with and manipulate, and then he would count the results. Um, and he would then apply his understanding of math to the understanding of science and the animal husband or the plant husbandry type stuff, and um, he would basically became what we now know as the father of genetics. All right. So in his little garden that he had, um, he had these what they call true breeding plants, or another synonym for that is pure breeding plants, Okay, uh, which basically means that if you let this plant mate with itself, the offspring would look exactly like they would be cloned. So if we had a pea plant that had purple flowers and we let it like basically self-pollinate, you're going to get more plants with purple flowers. You're going to get exact clones. Okay? Now, here's the thing. He would have different variations of these true breeding plants. And we're going to talk about flower color in particular with peas because I think that's the easiest one for everybody to kind of take a look at and understand. So there's purple flower pea plants and there's white flower pea plants. And then what he started to do, since he had these purple and white flower pea plants, is he wanted to know well, what would happen if I take the purple and the white and I mix them together. And so he began to cross-pollinate the pea plants. And the way he would do this, the way he would control this, is you have to understand the structure of a flower. Flowers, right, they've got the male parts, which are the stamen, right? These are the male parts here. That's what produces the pollen. And you have the female parts here. That's the carpal, which consists of the stigma and the style and the ovary. And down here would be the ovules. So what he would do is he could cut off the male parts, keep them separate, and then use the pollen, and he could cross-pollinate with the male parts on just the female parts that he needed to. So he could control how he was pollinating and what flower mated with what flower. Uh, and they still do this today at greenhouses to produce certain types of flowers, certain variations, color patterns, that type of thing. All right, now, here's what he thought was gonna happen when he mixed a purple and a white. This is back in like, you know, 1840s, 1850s, uh, you know, Europe. So this is not a real technological era. What he understood was that when he was walking through the countryside there uh, near the monastery is that he could see many offspring um, which shows similarities to the mixing of the parents. When he would go and see farmers and they would have like sheep and they would mate this male sheep with this female and then they would get this certain offspring. And I'm like, well, why did you do that? Well, you know, I wanted these particular traits. So he understood that um, in nature and in animal husbandry, a lot of times people would cross certain traits that they wanted to see both traits in the next generation. So he thought there was going to be like a mixing. So when Mendel then took his purple flower and his white flower pea plants and he bred them together, he didn't get any mixing. Right? You would expect probably that if you took a white flower and a purple flower and you bred them together, you'd get like a light purple. That didn't happen. So he got curious. He's like, well, why didn't I get a mix? He was only seeing one of the colors. Okay. This is what you would see in nature, right? You know, you take take the bull, take the cow, mate them together. You know, maybe this one has certain traits, this one has certain traits, and you want to get a mixing of traits in this offspring. And Mendel wasn't seeing that in his pea plants, and it confused him. I mean, this would be like maybe a typical pastoral scene in the Czech Republic near his monastery back in the day, or Austria, rather. So, the seven traits that Mendel could look at, and he did look at, uh, on pea plants. He had different heights, different flower positions, different pod colors, pod appearance, different seed textures. That would be like the pea itself. The different colors of the pea itself. They could be yellow or green. And then flower color. They could be purple or white. For those of you that are more visual, right, this is basically all the different things he could look at. Tall, short, where were the flowers? Were they basically at the ends or were they in the middle? The different colors of pods, right? 
I like this one. This is one we're going to focus on is the flowers, because I think it's the easiest one to see and understand. All right. Now, here's Mendel's hypothesis. He said, based on his observations, Mendel expected a purple flower plant and a white flower plant to produce a kind of a light purple plant. Based on his observations from nature of taking two different organisms and, and breeding them and getting a mixed result. When he bred the true breeding purple plant with the true breeding white plant, did he see all purple plants? Where's the white trait? That's what happened. He saw all purple plants. And he's like, well, is you know, the white trait, is it gone? Will it ever come back? Is it completely disappeared forever? And it didn't make sense to him. So, here's basically what he did. He took a purple flower from his true breeding generation, which is known as the pea or parent generation, and a white flower plant from the pea generation, and he bred them together. And then in this F1 generation, and F1 stands for filial, which think of like Philadelphia, right? Filial means brother or brotherly. So in this F1 generation, all these siblings, they would be what's known as hybrids. They're a mix. Obviously, if we took purple and white and we get all purple, the white trait's still in there somewhere. It can't just completely disappear. So these would be known as hybrids. They're a mix of two different traits, purple and white. But I can only see purple. And then what he did, when he was curious, he was like, well, what if I let a couple of these purple flowers, what if I crossbred them together? What would happen? So he did that again and again and again, and he would get what's known as the F2 generation. And in the F2 generation, something unique happened he would usually get this ratio of about three purple flowers for every one white flower, okay? So the white trait was still there. It was just being covered up, it was being masked. And this is where we get into the idea of dominant and recessive traits, okay? Here's his results written out, if you prefer that type of thing, right? There's our parental generation, here's our F1, there's our F2. And he came up with some rules, all right? So his rules. Inheritance is determined by factors, and one factor is dominant over another. Today, we call these factors like traits or maybe genes. Okay? Dominant traits are going to be the ones that mask other factors, and recessive traits get masked. So based on that, was the purple flower dominant or was the white flower dominant? Well, clearly you breed a purple and a white, and all you see in the next generation is purple. That means purple is the dominant color. He also had what's known as a law of segregation. Now, what this means is that when you take that F1 generation purple plant and you let it mate to another F1 generation purple plant, in order for that white trait to be seen again later on, it needs to be able to get away from the purple trait. If it can't get away from the purple trait, it's always going to be covered up and masked. So this is the segregation part where we can separate the dominant and the recessive traits. Okay? So this must have happened during formation of sperm and egg. If you think back to the last unit, and we talked about spermatogenesis and oogenesis and meiosis, remember there was that first cell division and then that second cell division, and that second cell division in meiosis, meiosis two, was when we would actually separate everything out. So this would be when the recessive traits would get separated from those dominant traits. So all this is going to happen during gamete formation, all right? Spermatogenesis and oogenesis, meiosis, okay? Now, this is the last thing I'm going to show you uh, for today. Uh, next week, we're going to start going through how you do Punnett Square. What I'm going to do is when I post this today on Google Classroom, uh, if you have any questions about the notes today, I'm going to want you to post them in the comments on Google Classroom so I can address them at some point. Uh, but as far as next week, we're going to start taking a look at Punnett squares. And what a Punnett square is, it's just a way to show possible combinations of breeding. Um, you know, what if I have like a, a little yellow bunny and I want to breed it with a little red bunny. What's going to happen? What color am I going to get? Okay. So now, this is not necessarily what would happen in the real world. A Punnett square is basically the probability, the chances, statistically what should happen, not necessarily what will happen. So you need to understand that first and foremost, that a Punnett square is just a possible combination. It's, it's the statistics, it's the probability of what you should get. Now, the way we're going to do this Anything that's going to be a dominant trait, we're going to use capital letters, okay? So like if it was a capital A, that would represent a dominant version of the trait. Lowercase letters for the recessive traits. So a lowercase A would be a recessive trait. Um, we 
fill out these Punnett squares, what we're going to end up doing is on the top and the side of the Punnett square, that's where we're going to put our gametes, a.k.a. the sperm from, you know, dad and the egg from mom. And then the offspring are going to go in the boxes in the middle. This is going to feel like math class for some of you guys and some of the matrix stuff that you guys do uh, in, in your new math that you're familiar with. All right, um, so that's all I got for you for today as far as notes. Take a look at this uh, today or over the weekend. If you have any questions, like I said, throw them in the comments on Google Classroom, and uh, we'll address them at some point next week. All right, have a great weekend, guys.